Hi, my name is Tommy Adams, and I'm very happy to be presenting with you virtually today at Pajamas Conference 2020. And today I'll be talking about smarter defect creation through machine learning. And so what I really want to talk to you today is about bugs. And whether you call them bugs or defects or issues, they're most likely the, the most important output and metric for your QA organization. And there are many different types of bugs. You have, of course, your useful bugs, which hopefully are your most prevalent ones. These are your code issues, uh, your functional bugs, logic issues, documentation issues, any of that um, that are kind of the everyday bugs that, that your QA org is catching. You also have your cool bugs. Um, these are more of your corner cases that you might catch through your chaos testing um, or your artistic testing. These are a little bit more unique and a little bit more interesting, um, but hopefully not, not too prevalent in your organization or in your products. And then of course you have your scary bugs. Um, these are the bugs that you catch um, usually just weeks before release. They're the ones that will stop shipment on your product, um, crash the, the whole production server, and, and critical situations you find out in the field. And so our engineering organization, um, our test organization, has been engineering what we hope to be the next evolution of bug. And that's the smarter bug. And smarter here is a very broad term. Um, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different teams and organizations. And you're probably already doing several of these things. Um, you can make bugs smarter by doing better data collection for debug, by automating the, the bug generation process, uh, by standardizing the format and the content for some advanced analytics. Um, our test organization specifically was looking at how we could use machine learning um, and natural language processing to make our bugs even smarter. And so this effort actually started a few years ago um, where we noticed a pattern in our defects. Um, we were increasing the number of defects that we were actually catching in uh, our test cycles, but we weren't actually seeing an increase in the quality in the field. And a general rule of thumb for test is that more defects is good. The more you catch in the test organization are, you know, the less that make it out to the field. But when we were saying that we were increasing the number of defects that we were opening up but not actually seeing that increase in the field, we thought that there may be some underlying problem there. And so what we did was to take a deep dive into our defects um, over three product releases. We looked at just over 4,600 defects for uh, GA1, GA2, and GA2.2 of one of our latest power products. And some of the numbers kind of surprised us with what we found. Nearly a third of our defects were actually found to be duplicates. Um, and then we also found about one in five, 20 percent of our defects turned out to be invalid. So either user error, configuration error, um, test case error, things like that. And we found that we were losing on average about 10 and a half days per defect that was returned for an unsuccessful recreate. So these are defects that the development organization passed back to the test organization for one reason or another um, to try and get a recreate of the issue and we were unable to recreate it. We were losing about a week and a half for each of those. And then we also found that about 30% of our defects had been returned at least once. So all of these we thought were fairly high numbers. Um, I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and you know we, we were going through a couple of transitions at the time we were opening up a new lab. We had a whole new test team, and this was, of course, GA1 and 2 of a new product. So we had new, new product, new features, new functionality. All of these things kind of combined to probably drive these numbers a little bit higher. Um, and so some of these issues may have resolved themselves with um, some more time and some more training. But then what about the next time? The next time we opened up a, a new lab or the next time we had a new product GA, we didn't want to be in this cycle of having these high numbers at the beginning of every product release. And so we recognize that there probably was some type of underlying problem that existed. Um, we wanted to look at what were the highest impact issues for that problem. And first and foremost, we wanted to look at this duplicate number. 32% was a very high number for the number of duplicates that we wanted to have in our test organization. And duplicates are okay to an extent. You want to um, track duplicates to make sure you're tracking the pervasiveness of an issue. But at some point you do reach a point of diminishing returns where opening up another defect for the same known issue really is not netting you any added benefit other than um, taking up time. And the second issue that we wanted to look at was the invalids. So 20% was a, a huge number for invalids. One in every five defects was found to be invalid. And ideally this would be around zero, but we really wanted to drive this down into at least the single digits if possible. And then the last thing was 22% of our defects that had been incorrectly routed. So these are defects that actually did end up getting a fix in the end, um, but they started off going into the wrong component, which can cost hours or even days into the defect cycle uh, to get those routed to the correct component. 
And so altogether, these three high impact issues touched about 74% of all of the defects in our analysis. So whatever solution we came up with, we knew we wanted it to focus on these three areas for the greatest impact. And so at this point, we have confirmed that a problem exists and we've identified some of the high impact areas. So our next step was to find where those impact areas are actually felt in the defect process. So we looked at our current as-is defect process, and this is a fairly high-level diagram of our as-is defect process, but we can already notice a couple of inefficiencies here. First off, we have uh, validation checks at a couple of different stages here after the test engineer opens it and after the screener takes a look. We also have debug data collection at several points in the process, and our dupe check is not until almost halfway into the process after the screener has revalidated it. So several inefficiencies here that we knew were related to our impact areas that we wanted to take a look at. And so we wanted to see where this process could actually be improved and what our ideal process would be. Um, first off, we knew that we wanted more automation um, and we also wanted a machine learning tool to help with some of those key decisions. Um, we did want one validation step right at the very beginning of the process and we wanted the duplicate check to be much earlier in the process as well to avoid any wasted time um, collecting debug, revalidating defects before we establish that it might be a duplicate of something. We also have smarter defect routing based off of a validity duplicate um, checking and the deep, um, debug data collection here. Um, and eventually we wanted this system to be reliable enough to where we could have the validation check uh, stop a defect in its tracks on its own without having to have human input. Um, eventually, long term, we also wanted it to be able to provide a best guess um, to development so that they would actually have a um, a starting point for their debug. And so the tool that we eventually came up with is called Defect Dialog. Um, it's an application that uses machine learning techniques to find similar defects using natural language input. And you can see some of the technologies used at the bottom. It is um, very much built on open source technology and all of the natural language processing and machine learning algorithms that we did use are standard Python libraries. Now we'll take a look at the machine learning algorithm, which is really the heart of the dialog tool. So this algorithm is a pipeline of multiple techniques and methods um, that we use basically to test the similarity of a user's input against the entire data set of historical defects. Our first stage is data preparation. This is our pre-processing stage where we actually aggregate um, the data, including the headline, hardware platform, phase found, several other label terms that we find in our defects. Then we move on to stage two, uh, tokenization, which involves splitting the text up into unigrams and bigrams. In stage three, we do our vectorization using bag of words um, to create the vectors based on the occurrence of each word. And then we send those vectors into stage four where they're weighted with a TF, IDF, um, or term frequency, inverse document frequency that actually weights the importance of each of those vectorized tokens. In stage five, we do our clustering, where we do k-means to return the k-nearest neighbors, um, which hopefully should include all of the duplicates and similar defects in our data set. And then finally, in stage six, we do our pairwise classification. And this classification is much more processing intensive than the clustering, uh, which is why we use clustering first to reduce our data set down to a more manageable size. And then we can do the much more processor intensive classification um, on that smaller subset. All right, so let's take a look at a quick example, just walking through the machine learning pipeline. So if this is the input that a user puts in to our tool, um, the system logged an IO bridge, unrecoverable error, Baker 700, 6970. Um, so we'll skip the stage one data prep because we don't do any data prep for the actual user input that's only done on the back end of the database. Um, we go on to stage two, our tokenization, where we create these unigrams and bigrams. And then in stages three and four, we'll vectorize and weight all of those tokens, assigning their weight for importance, again, using bag of words and TF IDF. And then we'll move on to stage five, which is our clustering, um, locating our nearest neighbors. And then do a player-wise classification against every, um, between the input vector and every neighbor within that data set. Finally, returning the in closest defects with the highest similarity scores. And now we'll move on to a quick demo showing the actual tool. This is the main UI for Dialog. We tried to keep it very simple, just a freeform text field and a search button to initiate a search. 
I'll go ahead and do a couple of examples here to show some of the capabilities that Dialog has. And here we can see the results returned. Um, a couple of things to point out here. We have the original routing location for each of these defects, uh, the final routing location, and also our validity check. We do rate the returned results on a similarity um, score from high, medium, and low, as well as highlighting some of the keywords that the tool actually found to be most important in the search. So here we can see several results um, returned back that all have somewhat similar string patterns here. If we were to actually dive into the results of these, we would actually find that these top three results are actually a duplicate of this last one here. So we actually have three duplicates and the original defect returned in this data set um, of just five. So uh, very powerful for being able to show potential duplicates um, or existing duplicates of any search string, human readable search string that you put in here. And the reason this one is actually weighted lower, even though it's the original, is because it's actually the oldest defect. So we do take into account time as well. When a defect was opened, um, we did find that the more recent defects are more likely to be related and duped to a search string than, than older defects. And here I'll put in a, another search string. And this time when the results pop up, what we'll want to notice is the validity score is actually going to go down from a check and we can see it goes down to 60% here. Um, so this search string actually relates to this defect here, one of the, the second hit that we had, um, but one of the, the top three here for a medium similarity. But if we look at some of these, um, if we were to actually dive down into the defects, we, we can see that some several of these have actually been returned as working as designed. So when we put in a similar search string here, we want to tell the user that there is a chance um, that this might not actually be a valid defect. That maybe it's working as designed or some type of user error, and maybe go back and check your configuration before actually opening up that defect. And I'll put in another search string here. And for this one, what we're going to highlight is the ability for the user to actually go in and change the weightings of some of these tokens that are generated by the tool. So in here, this search string, it's going to go in and vectorize this search string and determine what it thinks to be the most important um, tokens in this tool. Um, so here we have uh, remote restart, RR operation. We have these SRCs that have been highlighted and you can see that this is the actual defect that I, I pulled that string from and it's similarity is high. But what if we actually wanted to say um, that we want to focus on the SRC? We can actually go in here and this is a listing of all the tokens that we've, we've um, so far put into the tool. We can choose that token. We can adjust the weight um, and everything defaults to a one. You can adjust that up to a two. Maybe we want to de-emphasize this uh, remote restart operation. So we find that token, RR operation, um, which is a bigram here. Um, we'll reduce that to zero. And then we will redo our search results. And if you'll look, the search results, once they pop up, um, will actually shift around a little bit. So we'll de-emphasize the RR operation and we will emphasize the SRC string that I highlighted. And you can see here the RR operation, um, this result is still the highest returned result, so it still has some more similarity than these other ones, but we have de-emphasized this token, it's no longer highlighted. And several of these other results that were no longer, um, were not first showing up are now appearing because they do have this emphasized SRC token that we um, gave a higher weighting to. And for our final search string, I'll put that in. Um, for this, we're going to show um, some of the other options that you can change around. So we're going to um, look at date range. We default to two months, um, which is what our, our ClearQuest defaults to as well. And this tool is based off of ClearQuest data, um, even though we, we do have the ability to make it data agnostic and use Bugzilla or RTC data as well. Um, but we base it off of ClearQuest, which has a two month default range. So you can see in the two months, um, we actually don't have very many strong hits. We have one high hit here just because it matches this um, double bigram LPAR virtual storage page, which we actually do have up here. So that's the most likely hit, but nothing matches exactly. But if we go and increase our date range out to six months, so we're looking at a much larger data set at this point. Um, and when those new results pop up, this is actually an older defect. It's about four or five months old, I think. Um, we'll actually see the result pop up for the, for the actual original defect that that's pulled from. 
And then so we see in the new hits, we have one high similarity match, which is much older, um, but it does match the entire search string now. So this is our original defect here. Um, you also notice that the routing locations have changed. So that's one of the other advantages of dialog is that it gives you suggestions on where to route these defects. Um, so we can see that of these five results that we returned, three of them were routed originally to the screen team, but finally they were routed to GUI storage. So three out of five were routed to this eventual um, component. And so if we want to try to save some time, if we're pretty sure that we can rely on the final routing destination, we can actually open the defect straight to GUI storage, skip the screening component, and probably save a day or two off of the defect cycle. All right, so now that we've seen the actual dialog tool in action, we'll go just a little bit over its value proposition. Um, so we wanted to, again, develop a tool that hit some of those highest impact areas that we identified earlier as part of our analysis um, and that looked at defects that remained unanswered before the release. So we found that um, in a general release, we had about 3,000 defects that were deferred um, and shipped out later on as service packs and a little over 200 field defects that were reported post-shipment. So the dialog's main value proposition is really reducing that 74% of our duplicates, invalids, and incorrectly routed defects, and increasing the unique and valid defects that are found in the test cycle. And this has a cascade effect on the number of defects that we actually have to defer and ship out of service packs, and the number of defects that are found out in the field. And a side effect of the smarter defect analysis is actually better time efficiency as well. So in a typical test cycle, um, it's usually front loaded with basic testing and low hanging defects towards the beginning of the cycle. And that's where you usually see a lot of duplicates and invalids that take time to resolve in return, even though they don't give you as much impact on the actual product. Dialog decreases that time spent on those defects and in the basic test phase and opens up more time for advanced testing to catch some more complex cool bugs and hopefully some of those scary bugs too before they get released. And I want to go over just a couple of the things that worked in our tool um, development. So one thing was using just the bug summary or the headline for most of the pipeline. We did find that even though there was a lot of valuable data stored in the comments and the notes, um, those comments added way too much noise. It actually ended up lowering our accuracy and decreasing our performance. Uh, we also found that aggregating the labeled field metadata with the headlines worked really well as, as labeled metadata is basically free. So any data that you have that's already labeled in your defect organization or your defect tool, you can basically add that into the headline pretty much free. And we saw also that classifying natural language versus machine language, uh, we were able to do this with about 96% accuracy, again, just using some standard Python libraries. Um, we actually didn't end up using this because we dropped the comments from going into our pipeline. Uh, but this is something that we do hope to pick up at a, a later date once we can get the pre-processing done for the comments a little cleaner. We also did partition the pipeline um, into different subsystems so that we could have different weightings and different algorithms for each of those pipelines. So each of our different main um, super tiers for components actually has a slightly different algorithm that we tweaked for that specific component. And then allowing the manual adjustments of the token weights, this actually resulted in a double digit increase in our accuracy. So some things that didn't work for us, um, again, adding in those detailed bug comments too early into the pipeline. Um, they created too much noise. Uh, they're too long to parse. They did not vectorize efficiently. Um, and again, it just kind of created a very low accuracy and low performance. Um, so for now, we're, we're adding in the bug comments at the very end of the pipeline where we do do some matching, um, but not until the classification step in stage six. We also found that using anything larger than bigrams um, basically had an exponential increase in the model time. So we stuck with just unigrams and bigrams for our model. And then also the pure k-means clustering and pure pairwise classification. So we tried both approaches independently of each other and found that the clustering, although it was very quick, it gave you too much, uh, too large of a data set to return back to the user and it did not filter down to the, the best and most accurate uh, similar defects. And classification, on the other hand, gave us the most accurate results. But when we're doing pairwise classification across the entire data set, it took hours to return anything back to the user. So by having a hybrid approach of actually doing clustering first and then classification, we were able to kind of gain the best of both worlds. And then finally, a couple of things that we still have yet to try. 
um, we are looking at neural networks and a random forest classifier to help predict defect validity. Uh, we want our defect um, validity check to be self-contained rather than relying on the historical data set to determine validity. Um, we've actually done a little bit of playing around with this and gotten about 80% accurate with our self-contained validity check. So we're looking to integrate that pretty soon into our, our model. And then looking also at LDA and Twitter LDA classification models. Twitter LDA especially is um, really geared towards very short strings and tweets. So it's kind of perfect for defect headlines or bug headlines. And then looking at the increasing domain knowledge through weighted keywords. So actually allowing subject matter experts to help train the initial model by providing a weighted list of keywords that we can feed into the model at the very beginning. And like I've mentioned before, we do want to integrate some portion of the bug comments earlier in the pipeline. I think this just comes down to finding the correct way to pre-process that information so that it doesn't increase the noise and decrease the performance. So maybe just a very select set of uh, keywords that we can lift out of the comments and attach onto our aggregated headline. We're also looking at Doctavec for full bug vectorization. So vectorizing the entire document rather than just individual strings and tokens. And then finally adding in a user feedback loop to retrain the model. So adding the supervised learning um, in addition to the unsupervised learning that we already have in the model. So again, I'd like to thank you for having me speak at Pajamas Conference 2020. Um, if you'd like to talk about anything that I discussed here, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Thanks.